All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm Nancy Proctor. I'm co-chair of Museums in the Web. <laughs> and I am delighted today to welcome you to this webinar on making your presentations accessible. Um, we designed this uh, with the, uh, the presenters and speakers at Museums in the Web in Chicago this year specifically in mind. We wanted to help them make their presentations more accessible both to people with disabilities and to make them clearer and more impactful for everyone in their audiences. But this, uh, in the spirit of accessibility, this webinar is free and available to everyone. So um, you are very welcome to invite your colleagues and friends to join us now or also to access the recording of this webinar that will be made available online early next week. <coughs> Um, I'd like to introduce um, Ting Su, who very kindly agreed to lead this webinar. She's a teacher of students with visual impairments and an accessibility expert you know, in terms of both technology and pedagogy. Um, I met her actually for the first time at Museums in the Web last year in Baltimore and have been really inspired by what I've found out about her work uh, since then. So I asked her if she would be able to give us a sort of an introduction into verbal description um, for presenters. And she said, well, actually, I can do better than that. I can give an introduction to accessible presenting writ large. So um, although uh, verbal description uh, will be a component of, of this presentation, that will not be the only thing that we're looking forward to learning today. Um, and Ting has been working with students from you know, their infancy to uh, people who are in, in their retirement years. She's worked with people with visual impairments, multiple disabilities, and also deaf blindness. Um, she teaches in the Bay Area in California. She's completing her PhD in special education at the UC Berkeley and San Francisco State University joint program. And uh, really, her research and her work is very focused on improving training and professional development in this area. She also provides um, education and also consulting support for inclusive design and accessibility and also the use of technology to make education and uh, institutions more accessible. So do feel free to uh, contact Ting directly. I've put her Twitter handle uh, into the chat bar. Um, so I don't want to take up any more time from Ting's presentation. I'll be um, attempting to moderate the chat. Um, I will confess this is my first time doing that, so please bear with me if I'm a little tack handed with it at first. Um, I hope you, who are undoubtedly much more experienced than I in the audience, can uh, give me a few pointers and help me along with that. Um, so I think that's about it. Uh, hashtags, you can use MW2015. Um, and or the accessibility hashtag, um, which is A11Y. Um, and that's a great hashtag if you want to follow up on accessibility in general. Um, if you want to tweet Museums in the Web, uh, our Twitter handle is at MuseWeb. My Twitter handle is at Nancy Proctor. And again, Ting's is published in the chat. Hers is at TVI underscore Ting's. Uh, Ting, have I forgotten anything? No, I think that's it. Thank you so much for the, the lovely listening. introduction, Nancy. Great. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, for coming in live. And if you're listening to this recording later, um, thank you so much. As Nancy mentioned, the hashtag for this event is MW2015. And we do also have the accessibility hashtag, which is A11Y. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Um, at TVI underscore Ting. And also, I've provided these slides as a handout as well. And those are posted on a link um, located at bit.ly forward slash accessible MW2015, all lowercase and no spaces in there. So again, that link is bit.ly forward slash accessible MW2015. Um, so as Nancy mentioned, today's presentation is, you know, it was developed for the museums and the web community, but really it's for everybody. Um, so before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of today's presentation, I wanted to first um, start with the preamble of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And the reason why I'd like to start with this quote from the preamble 
is that it really gives people kind of a frame of mind when thinking about disability and conceptualizing, you know, what is disability. Um, so please allow me to read the text um, of this quote on the screen. Uh, disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Okay. For those of you who have the screen in front of you or who might be accessing the slide, I'll give you a minute to reread that. So the reason why I like to begin with this slide is it really kind of frames how disability uh, stems from lack of access to the environment. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about giving accessible presentations or kind of developing the environment, whether that's in the physical environment or the digital environment. So disability actually stems from the limitations that are imposed upon people. Um, it does not stem from the person um, himself. Okay? Um, so, you know, outside of, you know, everybody has a different idea of what disability is, but who does disability really benefit? Well, it benefits everybody. Um, there are a couple of numbers that float around online, um, usually from the U.S. Disability Statistics Department and also the Census Bureau. Um, the latest numbers come from the year 2012, and actually about 12 to 19 percent of our population has some form of disability. So this is where you might see that number one in five people have a disability. Um, and some of these could be age-related, some of these could be congenital, so stemming from birth, it could be from trauma, any number of reasons. So on the screen here, there's a three by three grid of nine icons. So I'll just describe the icons starting at the top left. And we have our classical sort of guy in a wheelchair um, with physical disability kind of icon. Um, the second icon is of a keyboard with a telephone over it. Um, the next icon is an ear with kind of a slash mark through it. Uh, the next one is two hands that are interpreting. Um, now to the bottom right of the icons, it's an eye with about half of the eye uh, shadowed out. Um, and then moving along clock, uh, clockwise, we have a braille cell, a six dot braille cell. And then there's a figure with a walking cane um, for a white cane. And then there's an icon of a telephone um, with sound coming out. And in the very center of this grid is the letter CC for closed captioning. So these are sort of icons that are meant to represent all sorts of, you know, quote unquote disabilities. So these stem from physical access, um, auditory access, visual access. Um, but beyond that, it could just be simply processing too. Some of us process information slower than others and just need our direction uh, our attention directed a little bit better. So for today's agenda, I want to just start off with just what is strategic communication? What do we mean by that? And how can we leverage communication to get our information across very clearly? There is also customized access. So what are the different means to access information? And then beyond that, it is how do we represent information in many different ways. So starting with strategic communication, there is language. Um, so who are you talking to in the audience or who is doing the speaking? There is the what. So what is language meant to convey? So these are the non-visual responses that people usually look for in an audience. Uh, there's audio polling like, hey, how many people have heard of disability? Uh, please snap your fingers if you've heard of disability. Um, so that's a good cue rather than a, a hand raise. Um, there's also talking a lot about text, and then there's also images. And the other item that language conveys is the where. So what are these directional cues that people, people are using in language? Um, all of that we can use to kind of specify what we're talking about a little bit better. Okay, okay so moving along. So on this slide, I've got just a couple examples of descriptive language. And using non-visual language cues also helps direct any audience person's attention more specifically. Um, so some of these examples are kind of adapted for a professional presentation, but the idea stems from Lori Hudson's work that she put out in 1997 called This 
that there. Um, so an example of this language is, this is our agenda today. Um, a better, more descriptive way would be, today's agenda will cover, and then dot, 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 you read the list. Um, okay, a this, that, there item would be, do you agree with that? And then you gesture for a response from a participant. Um, and better descriptive would be, Jeremy, do you mm -hmm. agree with that? To more specifically identify that person. Um, the next example is, we'll start over here. And you point to where you gesture to that person sitting in the front row. Um, and a better way would be, we'll start with the first seat on my left in the first row. So you can start to see this trend of how you can really focus people's attention just by being simply more descriptive. And then it just so happens that this kind of makes your language more accessible to everybody as well. Um, and the last example on the slide is, you can submit your feedback here. And more descriptive would be, you can submit your feedback by clicking this link, www. Dot, 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 and then you read the link aloud. Um, so this is great for people who just might be slow readers, perhaps. Um, maybe you're flipping through the slides really quickly, and you want to make sure people digest that information. Um, you know, I also teach in the classrooms a lot. Um, I also teach at SF State with grad students. And you know, when you call out that person by name, it really snaps everybody together and engages people's attention, too. So that's always really great. OK. So moving along, um, strategic communication. How can we be more strategic? So now understanding the non-visual cues in language, how can we actually be strategic about what we're communicating? So on the top right of the slide, I have a photo of kind of autumn in the woods. Um, and there's sort of a leaf-colored path going through. And the text is on the photo, and it says, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, the tree needs a better marketing strategy. So I'm sure many of you have heard this quote. And if I were standing in front of you live, I'd say, OK, who's heard this quote? Give me a couple snaps. Um, so I'm just going to pretend that you guys on your end are giving me some snaps right now if you've heard this, uh, this saying before. <laughs> um, so. I wanted to use this image as an idea of, you know, if you've got information on your slides and it's not accessible, it may as well not be there. So talk about making your information more impactful, right? Um, so what are some strategies for more effective communication? So number one um, is to simply describe pictures on your slides. So just as I did now with describing the image on the slide, it really helps to segue into your talking points as well. Um, but on the design end of it, it also makes you think about, hmm, what image do I really want for this that's going to actually support my presentation and not just be, as we call it, eye candy? Um, OK, so number two, some of you might be putting charts or data displays up, so like graphs of data. Um, you know, These are also a type of image that unless it's described, you know, people in the audience might get a little fuzzy wuzzy about what details you want them to take away, or people who need that description simply aren't getting that information. Um, so by describing your data displays, it really gives you an advantage in parsing that information to tell people what you want the main takeaway to be. You can really very specifically define that. Um, and the last item on the slide, number three, is to just read or present all the text. Again, this is really helpful for people who maybe have slower processing or maybe people who really get that information better when they can see it and hear it. Um, and you know, it doesn't have to be anything done separately, but it, should, you know, it could simply just be incorporated into a live presentation. Um, so just as how I you know, said on this slide, OK, number one, number two, number three. Um, or you know, this is also a way to present text um, online, too. So I'm sure on social media, everybody has seen those memes. Um, and it'll usually just be a photo of something and then text on the photo, um, kind of similar to the photo I have on this slide. Um, but you know, the problem with those sorts of displays when you're presenting it online is that that text is technically an image. So, um, people may not be able to read that text unless it's actually transcribed. Um, so uh, an example I like to share about, well, how do I do this? Because you know, social media, you've got the 140 characters on Twitter, 
or, you know, you're on Facebook and, you know, maybe you just want to make a post and you don't want to make a, a special line item for the image description, well, this could also be naturally incorporated as well. Um, so, for example, I have a food blog, and so, of course, I post many, many food photos. Um, but rather than saying, oh, having a great time at the Irish pub, and then I post a photo, I might say, oh, delicious mac and cheese and fish and chips at this Irish pub. So in that way, you really incorporate the information from the image into your inline text anyways. Um, so the idea is to really just make it mainstream delivery and not necessarily separate for accessibility. Okay, um, so moving on, along, accessibility is personal. Um, the ideal access to information has considerations for customizability, so having people being able to customize how they want to access information. Um, it's timely so that everybody can get the information at the same time as others. This is a really important piece, especially for my students and friends who are blind and visually impaired, where you know, nobody wants to sit around and wait for somebody else to deliver information to them kind of after the fact. Um, you know, everybody wants the information at the same time as others. And kind of along that line is having independent and primary access to information. So being able to access that information um, on your own rather than having it funneled through somebody else. So when you've got all these different items, you're, we're really talking about equitable access here. Um, equitable meaning that it is usable and accessible by everybody, um, given all of these different principles for ideal access. So we had talked about sort of different ways to leverage our language during the presentation um, so that it's strategic in delivering the information, focusing people's attention, and it just so happens to be inclusive. Um, I really like that approach where things are just sort of inherently inclusive and it's not necessarily separately um, accessible because then you know, it's not really that mainstream inclusion idea anymore, is it, <laughs> if it's separate. So now we've got, some, we've got some ideas of how to present dynamically. Um, and this slide is giving us the different accessibility options for how people can access your information in different ways. So along the right side of the screen, I have just a screenshot of the accessibility options from an iOS menu. So this is, these are options that are available on any iPhone or iPad or iPod. Um, and on this menu, there's options for vision, for auditory options, or physical controls. Um, so definitely I invite you to take a look at the accessibility menu, and that'll give you a really good idea of different options available. Um, sort of the main options that um, I wanted to highlight is screen magnification. So for all of us who might be aging and our arms continue to get shorter, um, the other solution is to magnify the text on the screen. Um, for those of us with low vision, you might also you know, need the screen magnification rather than being unable to read the text. Um, the other main option is text-to-speech functions. So these are for blind people who are using screen readers, so having the computer read whatever text is on the screen. Or it, you know, it might even be for people who are driving. So oftentimes when I drive, I just want to listen to a, a bunch of text. Um, some people, maybe their vision fatigues after a while, and then they might switch to, to speech, to text-to-speech. Um, for other people, um, you know, for people who are not using print, who might be using Braille, there are refreshable Braille displays that can connect to media. So whatever text is displayed on the computer will then be displayed in Braille. And that refreshes kind of dynamically as a person reads through the screen. Um, as Nancy mentioned earlier about image description, there are many different options for descriptions too. Um, some of you who are doing web design might know this as alt text or alt tags. Um, or anybody who's done sort of visual media description might know it as alt text. So this is just simply describing those visual images. Um, for those people with hearing challenges, uh, there might be captions. So this is just um, a transcription of everything that is said um, versus description where, where it's literally a description of the visual information. Um, captions are a transcription of the auditory information. Um, and then there's assistive listening devices so people can listen in and ramp up the volume if they need to. And um, anybody can go and open up this menu and check out the different options. So um, I think it's pretty cool that um, 
even accessibility is very inclusive, so anybody can check out these options and anybody can use them. Okay, so moving along, um, you know, one piece of giving a presentation is just standing in front of a room and giving your information and engaging everybody. The other piece of the presentation might be if you have conference handouts or lecture handouts. So you might have handouts, you might want to direct people to web pages, um, you might want to post things on social media. These are all many different ways of getting your information out. Um, so there's the idea of having well-designed multimedia as well um, to support your inclusive presentation. So number one, there's text. Um, so oftentimes we might give a Word document out as a handout or PDFs or PowerPoints even. Um, so for instance, this PowerPoint is available. Um, it was on the title slide, that link in case you missed it was bit, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash and then all lowercase no spaces accessible MW 2015. So PowerPoints are very highly visual, um, but they actually can also be accessible, um, meaning that they can be read by computers. Okay. Um, so there's also images in our multimedia and then video. So I wanted to spend um, the remaining time of the webinar talking about how to, how to disseminate these multimedia materials. So um, number one, starting with text, it all begins with formatting. So on this slide, there's a screenshot from Microsoft Word, and it's just basically a huge block of text. There's text from wall to wall in the document. There's no line breaks. There's no paragraph breaks. And there's no headings. So you know, let's say you were searching for a specific article. This is actually text taken from a journal. Um, so let's say you know, we open up our journals and you are specifically looking to find an article. Well, without formatting, you actually have to read from the very first word in the document all the way through. And what if your article is on page two? You now have to read through page one and through page two to finally find your article. So visually, this is very unappealing, um, but auditorially, if Anybody is using a screen reading device, so something that's text to speech, so having a computer read the text on your computer. Um, without what's called headings formatting, people are getting it auditorily in the same clump. Um, so using a screen reader, there is a way for people to navigate through headings. So sort of the same way we do it visually by quickly skimming the headings for what we want. There is a way to do that auditorily. Um, you know, for those of us who are driving and just want to quickly skip to the article, that's very handy to have the headings navigation. And for those people who really get all of their information in an auditory format, for those people who are blind or visually impaired, they need that headings navigation to quickly navigate. Okay? So moving along to the next slide. This is another screenshot from Microsoft Word. And you can see this is a layout of two pages. Um, and this is the same exact article but this time it's got the headings formatted, there's some paragraph breaks, and you can see, let's say you just wanted to skip right to the president's message. Well, boom, there it is. Um, so you know, visually, we see that the headings for each article um, in this journal, it's highlighted, it, I mean, I'm sorry, it's bolded, and it's centered. So visually, these are our heading structures. Um, now I wanted to bring your attention to this one heading. It's highlighted in purple, and at the top toolbar of your Microsoft uh, Office um, program, there's a little bar called Styles. And you can see that the, the, the title, President's Message by Jim Adams, it's highlighted using the cursor. Um, you can also do this uh, by keyboard navigation. And in the Styles toolbar, um, heading two is checked. So that means that this heading, President's Message, is now formatted as a heading two. So heading one would probably be like the, the journal title. Um, now each heading for the article is heading two. And you can see if you look at the article Literacy Media Decisions for Students with Visual Impairments, if I were to click that, that's also formatted as a heading two. And then the subheadings within the article, so the article talks about the position they're taking, the overview. So the position overview would then be formatted as heading three. Um, so just as visually, we could quickly skim and find the article on literacy and media decisions. And then, you know, what if, you know, we don't really care about the position. We just want to skip right to the results. 
or the discussion. Um, you can then navigate by heading and skip right there. Um, so again, this is about presenting information clearly so that it's usable and efficient. And when this is true for everybody, that makes it equitable access. Okay? Um, but the really nice thing about um, doing this formatting, laying this out in Microsoft Office, um, in Microsoft Word, is that if you save this as a PDF, um, you now get an accessible PDF and it maintains those heading structures. For those of you who might be working with a web designer, um, maybe you're not as comfortable with HTML, you can actually copy and paste um, this sort of text with the embedded formatting kind of under the hood and put that into um, a web page as well, and that will also help to give you a start with laying out um, the heading structures in HTML, okay? Um, so somebody in the chat window is asking about PowerPoints with styles. So at the end of this webinar, um, I do have a link for people who want to talk about, um, who want more information on you know, Microsoft Word, PDF, uh, PowerPoint accessibility. If you download my presentation, you will find that in PowerPoints, rather than having the headings and styles formatting, it's about um, arranging the objects, so ordering the objects so that it reads in the correct way. So for anybody using those PowerPoint templates, um, if you use the standard templates, um, it usually will read the text box first, and then it'll read the content box second. Um, and so it'll read the different text boxes or images in a certain order. And you can actually rearrange the order of these objects on your slides so that it reads in uh, an organized manner in the, in the way that you want the information to be uh, presented. So it's not necessarily styles, but it's more about reading order when it comes to PowerPoint. So there will be a link for that um, both at the end of the presentation and on a separate handout that will also be posted with this link to the webinar, okay? Um, okay, so for, um, for images in your Microsoft Word documents or when you've got images posted on social media, um, you can do a simple right click like in Microsoft Word or in a PowerPoint. And when you do a right click, that brings up some formatting um, options for images. So, you know, usually you can manipulate the formatting so it's more transparent or more opaque or it appears in front of or behind text. But there's also an option for alt text. And in that alt text option, um, you can input your description there, okay? So this is where you'd want to think about how do I want to describe this image that's embedded in my Word document that I want to give out now. Um, so you'll find that when you click the alt text box, there is one text box for the title bar and another text box for description. Um, you do want to keep the title box blank and only put your description um, text into the description box. Okay. Um, so those options are available both in Microsoft Word and also PowerPoint. For images, we have different ways to describe images. Description is sort of like your your entry level into accessibility is just simple description. So there's basically three key steps, and these description guidelines come from the Describe and Caption Media Program, or DCMP. Um, so these are really nice field guidelines um, that are out for people to refer to. So three key steps are just observing what needs to be described, analyzing it, and then communicating. So in step one is to simply describe what you see and don't refer. Because again, this is about primary access to information. So um, you know, people should kind of maintain that control over inferring what they want from an image. Um, so you could identify elements of the work by segments. So you can identify objects or people or setting or the arrangement of things in a picture. Um, descriptive elements, so these, these would be color, shape, line, texture. Um, this kind of depends on the purpose of that image. And you know, if any of you are in the museum world, you know that a lot of kind of mood can be conveyed through the color or texture of things. So that would perhaps be something that's very important to convey. Um, for my students who need access to images and textbooks, they might not need to know exactly the texture of something, but they might need to know let's say, the color of a line or the color of a wedge in a pie chart, if their teacher is going to be referring to it by that. So part of that kind of understanding and 
um, knowing what to describe is understanding the purpose of that image. Um, also, the use of vivid language um, can be very helpful in helping to convey tone, as we know, or themes. Um, and it also helps to be concise in language, too, by using something a vivid vocabulary. Um, you know, if you're describing video, you know, definitely you don't need to try to fill every pause. It's really sort of like just-in-time description or on-demand description. So kind of just adding that description as it's needed, as needed um, description. Okay. Um, so step two, um, this is part of like to analyze and understand the work to be described, um, part of that analysis of the image, um, kind of understanding what's happening, what needs to be emphasized, and what are the possible meanings that this image is trying to convey, um, and then kind of conveying that via description. Um, again, we're talking about understanding and analyzing the goal or the purpose of the image. Um, or the object or the theme to be described. Okay, the third step, um, step three in description guidelines, is to now that you have observed the image, you've analyzed it, now it's to communicate it. So having you know very clear and precise thoughts about what you want to communicate, um, and you know talking about orderly flow, that definitely happens with description too. So generally, you want to start with sort of the overall big picture, so starting from a general idea, and then narrowing it down specific, um, to more specifics. Um, so an example you have here would be, you know, in a textbook, it might be a flow chart of, um, you know, the, the process of evaporation and condensation in a storm cycle. So you would want to give the general overall picture and then kind of zero in on each piece of that flow chart. So, you know, if you're talking about a piece of artwork, again, it's kind of giving the overall, and then you can direct people's attention to different pieces of that artwork and kind of narrow it down to more specifics. Um, again, it's that concise description and prioritizing the description, so giving the key information um, first. Um, again, the use of vivid and descriptive words helps to eliminate extra information in language that's not needed. And also using consistent vocabulary. So for example, using present tense, um, such as walks versus he is walking, you could just say he walks, okay? Um, so, okay, so now we've talked about text, we've talked about images, um, and sort of the last foray into description is now video description. Some of you might um, know of this term as audio description. That's sort of an older, more traditional term. Um, kind of a lot of kids these days, you might say, um, is, are using the term video description. So this is different from captioning because this is describing the visual information that's happening, where if you're not attending visually, you would perhaps miss that information. So for example, if you're watching a movie and all silent and the main character is kind of creeping down the hallway and peeking in through a door, a secret door, this is not visual information that needs description. So I wanted to give you um, kind of a, a resource here. It's a, a new tool available. It's free. It's called You Describe. It's available at www.youdescribe.org. And um, the icon, their, their logo is on the slide here. And this work came out of an organization called the VDRDC. Um, they're part of the Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute, and it's the Video Description Research and Development Center, VDRDC. Um, so again, you Describe is a free tool that allows anybody to add video description to any YouTube video. So if you think about all the media that's on YouTube, how much you might use on a personal level or on a professional level, that's a lot of content, and it's so amazing that we now have this tool for anybody to add video description um, to any U uh, YouTube video. Um, people can then log into YouDescribe and view all the YouTube videos with description, and you can also share out the link, and anybody can view the video with description using the link. Um, if any of you want to give it a shot and or are more interested in how do I do video description, um, there's a couple hashtags that are associated with video description. Uh, the first is hashtag or pound sign, uh, V-I-D-E-S-C, so VDesk. So people who talk about video description use this VDesk hashtag. And there's also um, 
kind of a running thread for people who are submitting requests for video descriptions. So a lot of these are those blind users who are saying, hey, you know, everybody in my community is talking about this one cat video, or everybody is talking about this other video at work, and, you know, it needs description, and I, I, I need to access it. So there is a means for those people to submit a request. Um, I've also submitted requests as well um, as a sighted person, and, I, you know, this might be a video where I'm like, wow, I really want to share this with a friend of mine who's blind, and I don't have time to add the description right now, so maybe later, or maybe somebody else could add their version of a description, and I'll do mine later. So the hashtag for that is hashtag YD request, um, stands for you describe request. So this is sort of like the request hotline for people who would like to request a video description of any video. Um, so that's pretty handy too, because then you can, um, kind of have your pulse on what the needs are. And if you know you just have some free time on your hands, you can do that. Um, at the end of this webinar, there's also a tutorial for how to use YouDescribe um, and kind of further links about that, OK? OK, so other meaningful representations of multimedia um, include, of course, we talked about description. Um, but you know, this is the case if you're working in your museum and you're working with a uh, community, maybe you're doing like an educational uh, project or some sort of activity, some sort of community activity, and you have different types of things to hand out um, in the classroom. Um, so we've got description. Um, we've got raised line drawings, also known as tactile graphics. And an example of a tactile graphic is actually this first a photo on the bottom of the screen, all the way to the left. Um, it's a tactile graphic of a multipolar motor neuron. And you can see from the photo, perhaps, that parts of this motor neuron are raised. So um, it's a raised image. And you know, by raising it, you can more likely feel the outline of the neuron. However, we all know that neurons are not flat. Or I think we all know that. <laughs> so you know, there's usually like a cell body and nucleus that's actually rounded in shape. And then there's like the, the tail of the axon um, that's sort of like the, those pop beads when you put them together. Um, so for, you know, for students who need a little bit more scaffolding to understand how it's being represented as a raised line, you might want to kind of take a step back and first model it as a 3D object. So this is a really, really great area for 3D printing, which is like this hot new technology in the mainstream tech space, to really make an impact um, for accessible design and inclusive uh, materials, too. Um, also, at the end of this webinar, there's a link to um, another webinar that I did on the, using 3D printing for accessible media. So I can refer you to that um, for later on. So the second photo at the bottom of the slide, the middle one, is actually a rendering of that 3D object, that 3D object printed with a 3D printer, OK? So having that 3D object really can convey that, that whole idea of the sphere and the tail. And um, you know, it's modeled. Um, and sort of the last representation, this is really applicable for people putting out digital media, so maybe like a, an iBook, or just having something that's interactive on your website, um, perhaps. So sonification of these data displays. There's a new file format called ChartML, and this is a way, it's kind of an emerging technology right now, but definitely keep your eyes out for this. Um, keep your eyes and ears open for this, because it's coming down the line, and it's, it's going to be hot. So this would be, allow for anybody to interact with any sort of data display, such as the scatter plot that's, um, that's shown here in the slide, for anybody to go through and listen to how the data is spread out. So you know, the old way for a screen reader to access this would be, you know, assuming that there's description under the image, would be to go through every single data point to find what you're looking for. But with sonification, you can quickly kind of skim through the sounds of the data points and listen for something that's higher pitch if you're looking for a higher data point, or listen for something that's a lower pitch if you're kind of skimming for the lowest data point on a chart. Um, similarly, the sonification uses stereo sound, so something that's coming out of your left earbud, you know it's going to be more towards the left side of the x-axis, and something coming out of the right earbud is going to be more towards the right end of the x-axis. So 
So definitely do keep your eye out for chart ML because this is going to be a really fabulous way to sonify data. I mean, how great does that sound, huh? Um, and again, this is great for anybody to really engage um, on, on many different levels with, with a data display. Okay, so outcomes of presenting things for an inclusive uh, audience in, in an accessible way is that it really benefits everybody. Um, you know, a lot of us are in the professional space, and uh, when everybody can access things, it really ups the level of professionalism. Um, it sets the tone also for everybody in your audience. So again, this is about that community outreach, setting the tone for everybody in the community to support every other member of the community. Um, you know, as things get more digital, uh, we really want to think about things that are born digital, so things that are always digital, never hit the paper. But the other end of that is to ensure that they're also born accessible. So making sure those websites have the heading formatting, making sure all those images have the alt tags. Um, I put three letters here as my fourth bullet point, and it's UDL. Um, it stands for Universal Design for Learning. This is sort of a hot word um, in the education space. And with universal design, I think it kind of just encapsulates everything we've been talking about in three principles. And those three principles basically are creating media with multiple means of representation to allow for multiple means of learning and multiple means of engagement. So we're talking about representation, learning, and engaging all members of an audience. Um, and of course, lastly, for those administrators out there, um, it's cost effective. Having things that are born accessible is a lot cheaper than having to go back and remediate the problem later. Okay. Um, okay. So um, this is kind of bringing us to the home stretch of the webinar. Um, I have a slide here of resources, and this will also be available as a handout, as well um, as, well as um, other resources that are going to come up in the Q and A at the end. Okay. So um, just to start from, we have community accessibility. So there's a website, webaim, W-E-B-A-I-M.org. And there you can find sort of more specific guidelines on web accessibility, Microsoft Word document accessibility, PDF, and PowerPoint accessibility. Um, there's a link here for a webinar on 3D printing for accessible media. So kind of extra considerations when you're using 3D printing for accessibility, um, not just kind of um, for, for entertainment or fun. Um, that link is bit, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash I-S-T-E hyphen 3D printing. There's also a link to a handbook for museums and educators for accessible programs. That's available at www.artbeyondsite.org forward slash handbook. And for those of you who want to read more about description, the DCMP published their description key. Um, it's mostly guidelines for K-12 education material. Um, and that's at www.dcmp.org forward slash description key. And for those of you who might be in the heavier STEM area, so science, technology, engineering, and math, um, another organization has put out guidelines for how to describe those STEM images. And those are available at ncam.wgbh.org forward slash experience underscore learn forward slash educational underscore media forward slash stemdx forward slash guidelines. I know that's a bit of a long URL. Um, so if you are able to download this uh, webinar, that's great. You can just click on the link. Um, I see that there's a question about documentation, specifically about chart ML and sonification. As I mentioned before, that is an emerging technology, but I will be sure to provide any documentation or resources I can um, in the handout that will also be posted after the webinar um, completes. Okay? Um, finally, for those of you who missed the title slide in the beginning, um, this PowerPoint is available for download for your own information at um, bit, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash accessible MW 2015. And that's all lowercase, no spaces. Um, and I've also provided my contact information here in case anybody wanted to follow up with anything or would like more information. Um, I have a website, so you can find me there on the multiple uh, social media sources. Um, it's at www 
www.tplus.education, and I am on Twitter at TVI underscore Ting. Um, so let's see, I'm going to unmute to allow Nancy to kind of wrap things up, and if there are any other lingering questions, I'm going to allow Nancy to um, kind of field those for me, because um, I was able to catch a couple of the questions through the chat window, but perhaps not all. Um, I wanted to let you know that along with the webinar recording, um, we will have links to a virtual handout, and also if there's any other Q&A, um, I can include a transcript of that as well, okay? Okay, thank you so much, Ting, and thank you also to everyone who hung in there with us as we uh, figured out how to get the audio to come through your computers as well as the phone. Um, Ting, I think there's one other question from earlier on, which was from Liz Neely about PowerPoint. Does it have styles uh, in the way that you were speaking about styles in, I think it was Microsoft Word? Yes, um, so it's, it's different. It's more about the reading order in PowerPoint. Uh, rather than the styles formatting. So the reading order is meaning um, kind of reading the text in boxes in the correct order. Um, so that was mentioned very briefly, um, but for more specific information, I would definitely recommend going to that web in website. Okay. So Tracy Bird Fulton asks, saying, I've been using Markdown to create slides through the deck set. Do you have any idea if that plays well with formatting or the use of hashtags to create headers? I'm actually unfamiliar with that. So I can go and do a little bit more research on that to find out. Um, if anybody is interested in just kind of doing a quick accessibility check, um, sort of the down and dirty way to do that is to open it on your iPhone or iPad, so anything that's iOS. Um, and then you can turn on VoiceOver, and if it will read through VoiceOver, it is at least accessible in that way. So that would be sort of like the, 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 the quickest accessibility check. Okay, any other uh, questions for Ting or comments for the group? Okay. Well, um, it sounds like that might be um, a wrap then, Ting. And um, thank you again, everybody, for your patience as we uh, kind of got everything working more smoothly from the technical side. As Ting mentioned, um, this is going to be recorded. We will publish the captioned version of the video early next week. And uh, I just want to remind you all as well that um, there is a page on the Museums in the Web website um, which provides information on presentation guidelines. There are a couple of webinars from 2013 there um, with some tips from uh, conference veterans, uh, veteran presenters on uh, making a great Museums in the Web or other conference presentation. I'm just sending through the URL for that page now. We will um, add the link to Ting's webinar to this page too. And uh, just as a reminder, um, Ting, I believe you said the, the URL that will go directly to the recorded presentation will be bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-I slash accessible MW 2015. Is that right? Um, so that link is to the slides, actually, the PowerPoint slides. To the slides, um, okay. Yeah, we'll, ha we'll have to publish okay. the link to the recorded webinar later. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me send that through to everyone now. And uh, yeah, so thank you all for joining us. I mean, obviously we're we're trying to get out of a sort of a vicious cycle here, which I think Museums in the Web shares with most museums and other public institutions. Which is, um, in fact, we uh, typically don't see very many attendees who have some sort of disability um, or, or have trouble accessing our conference presentations because those haven't been terribly accessible to those people. So it's one of these, uh, again, vicious cycles that we're trying to break out of by making our content more accessible. And hopefully that will enable us to attract a broader audience. Because until everybody can come in, we are operating with less than 100% of our potential uh, human resources in this field. So. Um, 
really critical both for greater accessibility to those who are already joining MW and uh, expanding our field for future um, to really uh, open the doors as wide as possible. So thank you all for doing your part in uh, getting trained up in this way. I mean, all of these things take practice. Um, this won't be our last opportunity, and we hope to see you again soon. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Nancy, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. All. you. Cheers. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.